Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so delighted today to be joined by the wonderful writer, director, and actor of the movie Scrambled, Leah McKendrick. And I wanted to start by asking a little bit about how you figured out the approach in telling the story, because what's so wonderful is the way that it goes into so much detail about the journey of going through egg freezing. And we get so many specific elements of even just what does it look like cost-wise? What are the procedural aspects of it? And yet it's always delivered in a way where it's led by character first and foremost. So even a conversation with her mom and talking about it feels like character exposition. And I was interested if in the writing process, it felt like there were challenges in making sure that it was always driven that way um, as you're kind of focusing on the importance of also giving those elements within the story. Mm. First of all, thank you for having me, Mara. I'm so stoked to be here and to talk to you. Um, honestly, I'm I'm not trained as a screenwriter. Like I didn't go to film school. I went to acting school. So I think I always lead with emotion. I don't have a deep understanding of how scripts are supposed to work to, to be totally frank with you. I don't half the time know what I'm doing, but I, but I think my North star on this project was that I started writing it when I was living it and when I was in the thick of it. So I just felt like my, my driving um, goal through, through all of it, even today was to tell the truth and um, on some level, maybe because I've been working as a screenwriter for a few years now, I think on some level, unconsciously, I have learned some rules. I have learned, you know, that we want to stay in someone's heart and we want to stay in their POV. And that if you feel close to this person, you will feel close to when they, when their experience, you will feel close to their failures and you will experience their um, uh, empowerment and their wins as well. That was my hope, but I don't, I don't have an, an awareness of how I, as far as a surge surgically creating the script, I don't always, I'm not always super aware as far as how I do certain things. I just lead with my heart most of the time. I love that. And especially you. what, what you're <laughs> touching upon there in terms of POV and really wanting us to feel close to, to Nellie, who's the central character in the story, because it really feels like that also influences how you've u- utilized the camera as a director and the way that we see the story from different, very specifically thought out angles and, and movements in the camera. And so how did that idea of really wanting us to feel close to her as a character and have the story told so directly through her POV influence the way that you wanted to use the camera as a director? Well, my, my cinematographer, Julia Swain was my queen and my leader in a lot of that. I spoke, I got some great advice from Bruce Miller, a mentor of mine, who's the creator of Handmaid's Tale. And he told me, because I had such terrible imposter syndrome headed into this process of directing and writing and starring in a feature film about my own experience. And I felt like, I don't know where to put the camera and what if I, I don't want to just cover it with close-ups and, you know, wide shot close-ups and, and, and inserts. Like I just, I want to be creative. I want to be inventive, but I don't know what I'm doing because I didn't go to film school. And he said, you need to forget all of that. And you need to speak in the language that you know, because by trade, you are an actor and you're a writer. So your, your voice, your POV is always emotion. So speak in those terms. Don't try to tell Julia, put this light over here, grab this lens, just say, I want it scarier. I want it more raw. And so I thought, oh my God, this frees me up. She will translate that into her language. You're never going to be able to do her job as well as she is. You're never going to be able to do anybody's job on the set as well as they are. They are expertise in their fields. So I thought, wow, I don't need to know anybody's job, but the emotion of the film. And that I do know that I know because I lived it. So with that, I just kind of, I stuck to what I wanted the film to be. And I wanted the film to be raw. I wanted the film to be honest. I wanted the film to to encapsulate loneliness because that was a really big part of the process for me was feeling very, very deeply alone. So from there, Julia and I would go scene by scene, shot by shot, discuss in this scene, how do we encapsulate the loneliness? So that was sort of our North Star. But in the end, really, the theme is self-love. It's it's about a journey that Nellie goes on, a journey that I went on that felt like punishment. But in the end, I felt that it was really a, an act of self-love. 
And and as a film as well, it doesn't even just broach on the idea of like fertility and parenthood for her journey. There's all these supporting stories and and moments. You know, we see a brief we see a grief bereavement group for women who've lost kids during miscarriage. Um, you know, we even have that scene early on with like June Diane Raphael, where her character is talking about how much it cost and how hard and how painful it was to become a mom in her early forties. And <laughs> so there's so many different breaths that you've all already right, also included through the other characters. And so what was important to you in terms of telling the story and centralizing it through your own personal experience, but also in finding these little touchstones and ways to speak to a lot of other experiences throughout the film? I mean, I think I, what I always try to do is just speak completely honestly, that if what I am creating is deeply personal, my my prayer, my hope is that it will be universal. I don't know what I can do outside of that. Do you know what I mean? It's like, all I can do is speak to my real life, speak to my real life experience, speak to my struggles, speak to my embarrassment, my humiliation, my shame and hope from there that other women can, can connect. And, and the beauty of it is I feel like so many women have come to me with their fertility stories, whether it's freezing their eggs, or I feel so much pressure and I don't want kids, or I'm married and we're struggling to have kids, or we're married and we don't want kids, or we're married and we don't know if we want kids. And just all of IVF. I mean, there's, there's so many millions of stories and it's, it's heartbreaking that we want to funnel millions of stories into one version of reality that makes sense to us and makes us comfortable, which is mom, a dad and 2.5 kids, right? It's like, it feels like it's a nightmare from the fifties. Right. But I think what we are starting to realize, and hopefully in some tiny, tiny way, my film will contribute to the idea that everything is valid, whatever, whether you want a kid or don't want a kid or do IVF or freeze your eggs or don't, not sure if you want kids, want to be the cool aunt, want to be the cool gunkle, want to do whatever you want to do. It's like, let's support each other and remove some stigma and shame from this process. Yeah. And, and within the film as well, once, once we see Nellie start going through the egg freezing process, you know, there's, there's that early scene of just how does this even work? And her trying to call the doctor when she's worried about an air bubble having gone in and like, can I die from this? I don't even know the answer to these questions. And then it feels like a lot of the emotional waves start to set in. And, and in hearing you talk about your own experience, I've heard you say that, that that was kind of it for you as well. It was like the logistical element at first was, was the stress. And then there's so many things that come to the surface that you wouldn't anticipate. And so how did that drive a lot of the story that you wanted to tell in, in going, you know, it's, it's the logistical side is scary in its own way. And then there's everything that comes up that you wouldn't have anticipated. Yeah. So true. Thank you for pointing that out. I mean, that's, what's interesting for me about my own film. If I'm self-aware is that I set out to make a funny, irreverent comedy. And I thought the hardest thing that I might face was the injections and the, the idea that I don't feel qualified to be in mixing my own meds and injecting myself with needles that that felt, I mean, I studied acting, like I have a degree in acting, like who was allowing me to mix meds? I didn't do very well in chemistry, you know? Um, and then what surprised me the most in, in reality and in, in my real life was that halfway through I've think I had done a pretty good job of figuring out the injections and I'd done a pretty good job of figuring out the mixing of the meds. And then this huge avalanche came of the emotional shit of where is anyone to hold me? Where is my boyfriend? Where is a husband? Where is my mom? Where is what, why am I such a loser and such a failure that I'm in this position when everyone else seems to have figured it out, seems to have fallen in love and found their person. And I don't think I'm a total fuck up, but apparently I am because I had to spend $13,000 and inject myself twice a night for 13 days. It just, it, it started, it's like the demons start to speak to you. The hormones are raging and you start to really look at yourself. And that's why I think the surprise of the film happens that same way, right? You hit the middle, you, you're laughing, you're on this ride and then it darkens because that was that reflect that was a reflection of my true experience that the first act of my actual injections 
I was cheering myself on and high-fiving myself in the room. And then halfway through, I just thought the emotional turmoil was much tougher than the injections. And and with that idea of the emotional turmoil of the character in the film as well, it, you know, she starts going through this journey in, in reflecting on certain elements in her past and certain relationships. But what I really liked in the approach to that is it didn't feel like she was trying to live in the past. It didn't feel like she was trying to turn time back and, and go back to another point. It was just considering everything that has led me to this point. I'm trying to figure out where I'm going next. So I need to kind of understand some of the elements that I wasn't considering before. Um, and so I just wanted to ask a little bit about how you wanted to include that in the narrative and and how you approached looking looking back without it feeling like living in the past, because I thought that was such an interesting dynamic to create. Yeah, I think a lot of my life has been, especially in dark times, has been spent retracing my steps and trying to figure out, trying to reconnect with a younger, braver, more optimistic self that doesn't feel that I have wasted my life or my time. And so in my film, we, we go back to her high school bedroom, we sing Mandy Moore, we put the prom dress back on and the, and the blue eyeshadow and the, and the glitzy, glamoury old makeup that's in the caboodle, you know, we, we start trying to try it on almost like a theater show, right? Um, because I think I've spent a lot of my time in real life trying to try back on my high school self and feel that the world is my oyster again, you know? So I, I, it was such an interesting thing because originally that sequence was so long and I did, it went on and on and on and I was living for it. And my producers were like, we get it. <laughs> we're going to get this down. This is going on and on and on. And then later in the film, she's trying to fast forward and she's kind of got the suit jacket on and she's trying to look more mature. And I, and I think it's because me as a third, I know I'm 36. I never feel adult enough for anything that I'm doing. And I never, but I feel very firmly that I've been pushed out of other age ranges. I feel like I'm definitely not in high school anymore. I'm not in college. They shoved me out, but I, I don't feel quite old enough to be 36. So it's the search of why don't I feel as mature and adult as everyone? Why do I feel closer in some ways to my high school self, but I also don't feel like I'm in high school and so, sorry, I don't know if that totally answers it, but I do feel like it's this constant search for at what stage of life am I in? Because the stage of life that I'm in doesn't seem to be fitting quite right. I mean, even just the scene that you were talking about where she's revisiting her younger high school self, so many of the visual aspects of that scene really kind of made it. And, and just immediately it's like, you can, you can feel that, that time period once you're watching that scene and you're seeing the makeup and you're seeing her pull out the crimper on her hair. Um, <laughs> But then, you know, there's a lot of other looks and feels that we, it kind of feels like there's times where Nellie's trying on different expositional elements in terms of how she's doing her hair, how she's dressing, you know, I need to project feeling very confident today. So I'm going to wear this specific outfit with this makeup. Right. And so how did you use different hairstyles, makeup and, and external elements like costumes to really also track the emotional spaces of where she's revisiting or trying to move forward to as a character? Right. I mean, I think music was a big part of it, right? Music helped me so much because it's so funny because I, I don't know if this is the case for most women or you, Mara, but like I dance in my room. Like I put on music and I try shit on and I'm like, I'm a businesswoman. I'm in New York. <laughs> I wrote in Cosmopolitan. I'm, you know, I have a, I have a husband. I'm always trying on characters. And I feel like when we're little girls, we play make-believe. We pretend that we're princesses. We pretend that we're queens. We pretend that we're English women, like all these different things. And I think in some ways I still do that. And I'm still trying to understand myself. That's what I think is a lot of the when I watch the film now, because I've obviously seen it a million times and worked on it, but I, that's what I see in myself that I don't, I don't think I knew as I was writing it, that it's always a search of trying to tap into who am I today? What feels authentic to me? Do, does being a mom feel right to me? Does being a single woman and, and my friend who was here 
my friend Amanda was here to celebrate the release of Scramble and she's pregnant. She's newly pregnant. She was like, I don't feel like a mom. I have a baby, I have a belly growing in me and I don't feel qualified to be a mom. She thought, I thought she's like, I thought it would go away when I found out that I was pregnant and I got married. And she's like, I don't, it's not gone away. I still don't know what's happening. And I was like, that's epic. And I hope that people people resonate with the film and go, even when you have two kids, you don't feel like a mom. You know, my best friend has two kids and she's like, I'm not qualified to take care of them. I don't know what's happening, you know? And, and can we just erase some of the stigma and some of the shame surrounding, we all have to knew, know who we are and what we're doing and what age we are and feel the age we are and feel like grownups all the time because it's scary as fuck to not have our parents around to tell us what to do. It's so scary. I also think with with what you're saying there and and some of the other things that you've touched upon is is also that idea that the film isn't trying to create answers. It's really creating a dialogue and asking a lot of questions. And, you know, there's, yeah. there's a really beautiful scene where she's with her friend who's just suffered a miscarriage and her friends there on the bed saying, why did this happen? And Nellie's response is, is along the lines of, I don't know why, but I love you. And it's not trying to fill a space and, and give a concrete reason why something like that would have happened. And so was it important to you in, in telling this type of story and especially with what you were talking about, about, you know, it, it can't tell all the millions of stories, but you're trying to touch upon so many different spaces that you really wanted to create a dialogue and, and bring up a lot of questions that people are asking themselves without necessarily feeling like you're trying to feed people answers. I don't have the answers, you know, I don't know. And that's why that was the answer of the character. Why did this happen? I don't know why it happened. I don't know. All, I don't know why I'm barely, I barely understand myself. I'm trying every day is a journey to better understand myself. Um, So I think through my work, it's, it is just me questioning. It's me questioning on screen, asking questions of an audience asking for their answers because I don't have my own. And and I'm sure some filmmakers, some filmmakers do have a lot of answers and they're like, here's the answer. And you get there to the end and it's quite satisfying and cathartic. And I hope that um, nobody comes to my film (laughs) expecting that I, because I froze my eggs, I have all the answers. The only answer I really have is that I, I'm proud of me. I'm proud of myself for being able to do this very scary thing and this very adult thing that, that felt like punishment and finding a way to reframe it as an act of self-love. And, and I hope that other women can view this and and see that if Nellie can do it, if I can do it, they too can do it, whatever they choose to do is valid. And, and I have their back. In, in in a different space in the film as well, there's also a lot of fun in terms of the dynamics you've created with her family, um, you know, whether it's conversations around the dining room table, but even just the scene where she goes to her brother's office and she's trying to convince him to lend her the money to, to go through all of this. And when he's refusing, she literally sits in the chair, making a lot of noise, causing a commotion in the middle of his workplace, refusing to move as he's trying to drag her off the chair. Um, and so I was just interested in, in how you wanted to shape that sort of sibling dynamic, because there are those moments where... They're completely adults around each other. And then there's moments where they're both regressing to their childhood versions of themselves because that's what siblings do. Yes. Oh my gosh. Me and my brother just fight. I love my older brother in real life. I love my older brother so much, but we have a little bit of a rivalry because we're such different individuals. And he's always been this golden child that I felt like it was so unfair because he was a dude that he got away with murder. And I felt like, because I'm a chick, like I even as simple as like, he was allowed to go out and, and he was just trusted and I was not. And they were, the answer was always, well, you're a girl. Well, you're a girl. Well, you're a girl. You don't get to do that. And I was just like, that's not fair. You know, when you're a kid, you're just like, that's not fair. You don't understand the implications that, you know, gender presents, but I, So I think, and I love what you said, because I think that's really true. Like one of my favorite shows is Succession. And I love when they revert to their like 12 year old selves and they're slapping each other around, even though they're like billionaires. (laughs) It's so funny and cool to me. And when you have siblings, you really get it. You're like, you never really grow up. And I think that's a little bit of the theme of the film, right? It's you see that even Jesse, her brother in the movie, is quite childlike, even though he's making a ton of money and he drives a Tesla, he's, he's a kid too. We're we're not, none of us, even when you're making money. and, And it's interesting for me because I, 
I didn't make any money at this for so long. You know, I, I was barely paying my rent. Any money that I made, I was putting back into my work and I was financing my short films or my music videos or whatever it was. So I never had any money until I finally had this break as, as a screenwriter. And then I, you know, I had a different life and I was able to pay for myself and pay for my life, but I don't feel like an earner. I don't feel more grown up just because suddenly somebody else recognized that that's a product that we would like to buy. I feel the same as I did when I made no money. So that to me is, is, the biggest, my, I always thought that I, you know, when I reach a certain point in my career, that's when I would be a grown up. And that's when my parents would recognize me as a grown up. And that's when my brother would recognize me as a grown up. And to this day, I don't feel like a grown up, you know, and I don't know if my parents are ever going to recognize me as a grown up. And, and I, my brother is definitely never going <laughs> to. <laughs> never going to recognize me as a grown up. So I think I wonder if me and my brother were two years apart, if when I'm we're in our 70s, if he will still be slapping me around and <laughs> making my life hell, probably. I know I'll still be slapping him around. So in, in terms of your work on this as a filmmaker as well, there's something interesting that you you talked about in terms of, of one of your last projects, MFA, where you were acting, you'd written and you were producing. And just, I thought it was so interesting to hear you speak about the two different spaces and the two different versions of yourself that you had to be, because obviously to be an actor is very much about tapping into your emotions and really connecting to that. And then to be a producer, you almost need to be able to suppress, you know, even if there's 10 fires happening directly around you, you need to be the calmest person in the room. You can't oh, yeah. kind of like dive into the emotion of that. Um, and that, that was one of the challenges in a project like that and so taking that a step further with this where you're now also directing and that's also another whole other side of you that it was asking for how did the experience of a, a project like MFA really feed into how you worked to find those different sides and to make them very cohesive with one another that's a great question honestly I don't think anything I will ever do in my whole life will be as difficult as making MFA I don't think anything ever will be that tough for me it was so hard. And I, and producing is so hard. I mean, your job is just fires, putting out fires. It's chaos and you have to maintain a cool head and you're the bad guy. You know, you're always the bad guy because you're, you're, you're handling all the logistics. And I traded in my producer hat for a directing hat. And let me tell you, and I got dope ass producers that held it down. And I had great producers on MFA as well, but, but I was one of those producers on MFA and that's, that's, that's not my strong suit. So I am an artist, you know, I am emotional. I, I cry. I take everything personally. I, I, I'm just an emotional being and I really struggle with um, fires and, and not taking it so hard and, and, and staying on my toes and just keeping it moving. I want to sulk. I want to, um, I want to shut down. And so on, on scrambled, I, I'm not going to even lie every single day. I was so grateful to not be producing this film because I did get to, as an art, as a, as a director, you do get to kind of stay in that space where you're like, I need some space, everybody, give me some space, everybody, or I need this, I need this. And everybody's there to support the vision. And I feel like suddenly you become a director and everyone is like, oh, they're having a moment, give them space. And it's so, you have so much like power, honestly, I hate to say this, but it's true. As a director, everyone kind of knows that they're there for the director's vision. So if I'm like, I need a moment, everybody give me a moment. Or if I'm like, bring me my actor, I want to talk to them. And I don't care if we're running behind, I'm going to have a, a little moment with my actor. Everybody's like, oh, the director needs a moment with their actor. And as a producer, there's none of that. You need to handle it. Go handle it. We're getting shut down. We're getting, the cops are here. The, the, the owner of the venue is pissed. There's no, I need a moment. There's none of that as a producer. So I think one of the biggest moments in my career, honestly, and one of my greatest gifts and one of my proudest achievements is not being able to have to, to not having to produce my own material anymore. It was out of need that I did it. I thought if no one's going to make my shit, I'll make my own shit. And now I'm just so grateful to have not produced. Scrambled. <laughs> With, with the worst is answer ever. I'm such a spoiled brat. I'm like, I hate producing. It's just too hard. I can't handle it. 
I'm too weak. I'm so too much of a crier to be a producer. No, but I, but I love the fact that you dove into that space regardless out of the the necessity to be able to like move your own projects forward and, oh, yeah. and with, with scrambled and, and making this film, I loved something that you said the other day in an interview about you feel like you got to tell the story the way that you wanted to and you got to make the film you wanted to make because that's not a given as a filmmaker. There's so many voices. There's so many external elements. There's so many people that come on board and like you were saying, have to really align and understand and see your vision and share it. Um, And so did you feel like there were challenges along the way or elements where it felt like maybe that you were losing that, that sense of this is the way I want to tell the story. Or did you feel like the path was always there to be able to tell the story exactly the way that you wanted to and needed to? I mean, it's such a, it's a miracle that anything ever gets made ever. I mean, take it from me who's been, I've been writing scripts in the studio system since MFA in which premiered in 2017. So it's been a few years and I have been so destroyed, devastated, heartbroken, like completely, oh my God, like on the floor in the fetal position, crying over my projects dying and getting just obliterated. And I now really do recognize how impossible it is to get anything made ever. And then furthermore, to get anything made the way that you wanted that people don't say that's not going to work. No, change it, do this, cast this person, hire this person. I felt really supported. And that's, I recognize that as my, on a, on my directorial debut, like it's just unheard of to have as much support as I have had. And I, I will take some credit for that. And here's how I will, because I think I've had a career for a long time as first as a singer, then as an actress, then as a writer, And I'm, if I had just shown up on the scene, it wouldn't have happened. And so I'm so, so grateful to the team that had my back, but also that, that I feel like I earned it. I earned the the right people around me, the right people backing me up that believed in me because I'd had so many deaths in this industry and so many different iterations and evolutions in this industry. Then in some way, I feel that this is a culmination of so many lives that I have lived in Hollywood that I I manifested and also earned a team that believed in my vision. That's so amazing to hear. Cause like you said, none of that is a given and you know, it's, it's such a wonderful film. Congratulations on the premiere at South by so excited for everyone to get to see it soon as well. Um, and thank you so much, Leah. I really appreciate it. I so appreciate you. Thank you.